welcome back to my channel my name is Tanika in case you're new here I also have ADHD but um why do we ever stop using the MAC lip glass hello like are you kidding it is so good I probably need a little lip liner and it would be even better but I digress welcome to closet confessions where I share more about myself my experiences in hopes that you will um, find some of these experiences helpful and useful to you in your life. My channel usually is about fashion and travel and beauty and all the things, honey. But I want to talk to you today about workplace trauma. Absolutely. It's time to talk about it. It's time to talk about it. A lot of times when you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s and probably 50s and 60s, but people are so quick to talk to you about relationship issues and relationship drama the most drama I've ever had in my life is in the workplace hands down period point blank it's always in the workplace and I don't mean like I got into it with my colleagues or like it's been beef for situations it is because for me I was ambitious I was hungry I saw my career path as the north star and I was willing to do the work to get to where I needed to be, not realizing that I was being hazed, I was being traumatized, I was being underpaid, I was being under-resourced, and my mentors, some of my mentors, not all of them, I've had some great mentors, but some of them were frankly taking advantage of me. Literally, honestly, and truly. So let me just go back a little bit to background. So I feel like every video I'm like, oh, I grew up poor, I grew up poor. But it's important to the narrative and the story so you understand my state of mind, especially coming out of grad school. So um, I dealt with a lot of financial trauma. It was like once I got my first six-figure job, it was like I wanted to keep that job. I wanted that financial security. Yes, I had a husband. He was doing well. But remember, this was in the early stages, in the early days. And in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, this is, I was like proud of myself. Like I was proud that I was able to make six figures. This is what they said it was about. I can finally like pay my student loans with a little bit more ease. Like this is what the girl said it was about is making six figures. But I still had so much financial trauma that I wasn't willing to do anything. I didn't want to travel. I was scared to like buy a bag. I was scared to shop anywhere other than Zara. This is, it's been 10 years. But in my mind, right, so this isn't even like today. Today, I understand people not doing that with six figures is not necessarily, those first six figures, 100K, is not necessarily the same as it was back in the day. I think it's still a good living, especially considering the average American is making like 60 something thousand dollars a year. You know what I'm saying? I hate when people try to discredit a hundred thousand dollars, especially for a single person. But I also understand it is not this great liberator and like all of your problems go away and now all of a sudden you can have the lifestyle that you imagined and dreamed. A lot of times you realize that the lifestyle that you imagined and dreamed is actually a million dollar lifestyle, right? And it was repackaged and sold to you as an American as a middle class lifestyle. And so that was some of what I had to realize. So I had a lot of financial trauma. And so because of that, I was willing to do whatever anyone asked me to do in the workplace. And that was so dangerous. Baby, if I could take back all of the power that I gave people. And let me just say this up front. It was white men, white women, black men black women it the people that were um notoriously problematic in my career and my career journey ran the racial gamut i will say this in my defense and to other elder millennials we grew up in a time where it was girl boss everything you were supposed to be all the things and you were supposed to be a girl boss, meaning like you were you were rewarded if you were young, you were a manager, you were a boss, you were making money, you dress fly like and it was so there was no work life balance. There was no soft life. Miss thing. I don't know where you girls came up with that. <laughs> 
When we were in the thick of our careers, it was blazer 60 hours a week, vacation once a year during Christmas time, and that was for four days. We were on call on the beach. Hello? Like, there was none of that. There was none of that. And that was passed down to me, honestly and truly, from elder Gen X women. A lot of them were black women. I'm just going to be honest. A lot of them were black women. And they were trying to show me how to make it in the workplace. And in doing so, they deeply traumatized me. They caused me so much anxiety. They caused me so much stress. They caused me so many sleepless nights. Because I was trying to get to the bag, Miss Thing. I was trying to get to the bag. I was willing to do anything to get to the bag. I was trying to do my work. I felt like because my work was good, I would be rewarded. Whole time, I'm doing somebody else's work. Whole time, this person that I think is advocating for me isn't advocating for me in the workplace like I thought they would. Whole time, this person is hazing me. Whole time, I'm playing office politics. I really don't need to be there until after my boss leaves. That's just an old school white supremacist mentality that was handed down and taught to me that I needed to be here and be on call consistently. Literally, that was the culture. So let's talk about microaggressions. Microaggressions in the workplace, when I tell you, microaggressions are called microaggressions for a reason it's because they're small they are aggressive but they don't raise they don't they don't rise to the level where you are just automatically like what is going on you know what i'm saying they don't rise to that level in that challenge and so you are like you literally don't know what's going on you know what I'm saying? But when I tell you, if you are going to navigate the workspace, you are going to go where you need to go. It's sad. It's unfortunate. But you have to learn to clap back in small ways that don't get you fired, Miss Thing, in a very corporate clap backy way. And you have to learn to ignore those things. And you have to understand that a lot of times people are doing those things. Because you're a woman, because you're black, because you may be young. You And when I say young, I mean you could be 50, but the person who's doing it could be 65, but they could see you as a threat. You get what I'm saying? Um, all of these reasons that you, it is not up to you to understand why they're doing those things, but you have to recognize their entire goal is to take you off your A game. Do not be distracted. Do not be distracted. Like you go in there eight hours, nine hours. You do what you have to do and you get money. And that's it. That's it and that's all. When I stopped formally working like my traditional nine to five, the last couple of years, I had to realize and focus on this. I am not my career. I am not what I do. I am not what I get money for. That is not all of who I am. Is that part of who I am? Yes. But that's not all of who I am. And I think when you grow up with an academic background, right, you get your bachelor's degree, you get your master's degree, you are rewarded in the workplace for how fast and efficient you go up in the system, that that becomes your identity, especially when you are in D.C. I worked in the Obama administration. You know, I worked for the Department of Education. It was a, I was around really smart people. You're rewarded for good ideas, being smart. And then I moved to New York City. I worked in nonprofit, right? You are rewarded for your ideas. And so that starts to become who you are, right? You don't work in corporate America. You are not feeding into the capitalist system, allegedly, right? Even though your donors are a part of the capitalist elite. Let's be honest, right? But like you in your mind, you are like, I am really doing this out of the goodness of my heart. And my heart is part of who I am. And this is part of my identity. But I want to tell some young career driven nonprofit hopeful out there. You are not your career. You are not what you get paid to do. That is not all of who you are. You don't have to introduce yourself and say your name and then say what you do unnecessary totally unnecessary let me tell y'all what i do when people ask me what i do now nothing much and i want to really see their reaction i have decentered career and labor from my life i and i know that's a privilege but like i am not interviewing with the person sitting next to me on the airplane i'm not that's not my that's not who i am as a person i don't need to do that and so I'm not going to perform career and workplace politics everywhere I go. I'm not about to be on 
every time because I don't need you to make money and I don't need you to succeed in those ways and I can decenter career in my life. Nothing much. And they're like, oh, okay. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they don't know where to go. Somebody once asked me, are you a stay-at-home mom? No. Not really. They were like looking around like, yeah. Let your mind wonder, Miss Thing, because now you don't you can't figure out how valuable I am because you don't know what kind of work I do. You don't know how I get money. You don't know what kind of labor I do. And so you don't know where to place me and where to find me valuable. But I'm telling you, when you start to decenter your job from who you are, your life becomes so much better. I don't recommend it in your 20s. I think that 20s is an interesting time. Um, and it is an opportunity for you to start the process of getting money. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily take this advice when you're, you know, 24 and you're like, oh, nothing. Unless, you know, you're unemployed. Hello. One of the questions I get asked all the time is about quitting jobs because I left my job. In case you guys don't know, I worked in social justice and politics and nonprofit organizations all of my career. I have a master's degree in public policy. Like this is what I would have considered my life's work. I no longer do that work. I resigned in 2020. Um, I started making content in 2020. I was still at my job. Um, but I decided to leave my workplace. I got really lucky because financially I was secure, but also financially I started to gain a tremendous income from content creating. So I got lucky at a time where I was stressed about like workplace and like my, all of these things at a, it was at a time where financially that was not a part of my decision making. And I recognize for a lot of people when they have to leave stressful work environments, they have to think about financial consequences. And so let me tell you this. I've never left a job without thinking about the financial consequences until the last one. Right? But let me tell you when I was thinking about leaving jobs, what I did. I always had another job lined up. Always. Always. I was dealing with financial trauma. I grew up poor, no resources. And also I had become the person in my family for whom other people turn to for resources and money and different things. So I didn't necessarily feel responsible if I left my job to go, you know, fry look at sea for three or three months. I think now it is more common to do that. But when I was really in the thick of some traumatic experiences in the workplace, I didn't think to do things like that. I'm just being honest with you. I really didn't. So I always said the girls, make sure you secure your bag before you go. M before you quit that job, make sure you secure your bag. I, I'm not saying mental health is less important than financial uh, security. But what I am saying is that financial insecurity can lead to a worse off mental health situation. Absolutely it can. We cannot sit here and act like those two things are mutually exclusive. I refuse to do that. It's just not sound advice. So I always tell people, make sure you secure your bag, whatever that looks like to you. If that's two months, three months, four months, if that's for going some of your, you know, daily pleasantries so that you can stack your money if that's getting a side job, a part-time job while you quit, you know, maybe something that you don't put on your resume. If you do some consulting, whatever, do what you have to do to make sure that you're financially secure so that once you leave that job, you're not robbing Peter trying to pay Paul or you're not like asking, going around begging because you left your job for mental health. Make sure that you understand that financial security is a part of mental health. I will give you a very quick example of me. When I was working in the Obama administration um, in the very early days, I had a boss who had a tremendous amount of equal employment opportunity cases against her. It's a white woman, okay? Allegedly, 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 allegedly. She was notorious for firing black women. Now, she was not nice to me, but compared to the others, she was kind to me. 
but I knew my number was going to get pulled. At some point, she was going to turn her venom on me. And I was young, and I was hungry, and I was working 60, 70 hours a week, and I was staying late, and I was doing everything that she needed me to do. And I was actually interested in investing in a promotion. When promotion time came, and she gave a promotion to this white boy who had been there for six months, and this white woman who had been there for nine months, and I got nothing... You got the right one. That's all I needed. Literally, I wanted to resign that day. And here's the thing. One could argue I was financially secure. I had a husband. I had savings. I had this. I had that. I didn't want to do that. I sat there. It was painful. It was traumatizing. My ego was bruised. I started interviewing. I started interviewing for nonprofit organizations. I started in interviewing for other government entities. I started reaching out to my connections they were not robust in 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 a lot but it probably took me like four or five months to find another job while I was working and sneaking off to interviews taking extended lunch breaks like afraid that she would like come back you know and find out and then just totally fire me but I remember the fear but I just had to do it anyway because I had to convince myself that the end was coming whether I chose it or not, so I had to choose the end now. Let's talk about mentors. Let me say this. I have been blessed. I have been lucky with some incredible, amazing mentors. Not just like people that were over me or supervised me or managed me, but I have been so blessed with people that were technically my peers, but because we had an age difference, they were so vital and important to the ways in which I grew in the workplace. Let me give an example, a shout out to some of these wonderful people. And, you know, I was young. It was my first leadership role. I was making less than everybody on the leadership team. I knew that, but I didn't know that for certain. And remember, we were told that you don't necessarily talk about how much you make, right, in the workplace. That was like taboo. I mentioned to one of my colleagues how much I made uh, because I was like, I think I need a raise because I'm managing all these people. I was managing a sizable amount of the organization. I would say over 75% of the organization I was managing. And she said to me, you make how much? And she was just like, you need to be making at least X amount. And that was a, like a light bulb went off for me because it put a number to a theory that I had already had. And it was in that moment that I made my first six figures, honestly. And that is what contributed to my salary increase moving forward because it was such a, a good and big, robust jump for me that it was just, she really helped me on my way, honestly and truly. Um, another one of those colleagues was, you know, I sat next to her. She was always just dropping nuggets, telling me what to do, making sure I understood that, you know, being visible online for an organization whose policies may not date well was not necessarily the best thing for me right and um i always kept those nuggets in the back of my mind i was always soaking up and learning and i mean she just you know she had the degrees she had the credentials she had the relationships but she wasn't like very vocal you know what I'm saying? She wasn't like out there. She wasn't rah, rah, rah. It was very clear from her, from her personally that her career was important. Maintaining a solid career was important. But like her family came first. God came first in her life. And I didn't understand it because she was um, older than me. Not by a lot, but just a little bit. But our, our kids were similar in age. So... I just, I soaked it in. I didn't always take her advice, but now that I'm older, I totally understand where she was coming from. And I'm so grateful for everything that she said because it literally helps me. Now, my colleague, the other colleague in this group, he was just, first of all, he worked at HR. 
So he knew for facts what the people was making. And so when I was about to leave that organization, because I didn't feel like prepared at a moment of transition, when there was a leadership transition, I didn't feel prepared. I didn't feel like I was, I didn't know if I was going to be retained. I thought it was my time to move on. I confided in him how much they offered me at this other job. And when my boss was trying to retain me, he basically was negotiating for me. He basically was like, well, they offered her X, Y, and Z. She's not staying unless you give her X, Y, and Z. And when I tell you my salary increased by like $70,000, because of the advocates and the people in my life, my colleagues, opening up, being smart about who you open up to, being smart about who you communicate with, and seeing these folks, even though they're technically your peers, as people that you can learn from and mentors. So I say that to say that I have had really excellent colleagues, really excellent mentors. I My closest friends to this day are people that I worked with. Over 75% of my friends that are my close, strong, like, girlfriendships are from my colleagues that I worked with. Absolutely. We were in the trenches together. And now we're, you know, fab friends. I've had some mentors that have traumatized me. I don't think I thought they were mentors, per se, or we had a conversation that that they were my mentor, but I very much looked up to them. And I'll give a very brief example. And I'll give an example, but baby, it's just like the friendship one. It's still, I still feel it, okay? Because it was a little bit more than a mentorship. It wasn't quite a friendship. I'll say this. I had a colleague who worked at an organization. First of all, we worked in the same field at our previous organization, and we were both looking to get into racial justice. She was is 10 years older than me, at least. I think to the exact day. I think we have the same birthday, if I'm not mistaken. And um, she started working at an organization, a racial justice organization, that I was a huge fan of. I was a huge fan of this organization. She started working there. And she knew I wanted to work there. And so I would talk to her, go to lunch, try to figure out how I could work there. At the same time, I was developing a relationship with her partner, like a friendship. You get what I'm saying? But... That those two things were separate for me, even though I can understand how they intertwine. We had a, I had a very good, what I considered relationship with her partner, very good relationship. Like we were good girlfriends, you know what I'm saying? But what I noticed really quickly is that our work styles didn't align. I was like, she was a workaholic. She was like very business oriented. She had an MBA, you know what I'm saying? Like she was like the white man in the workplace, even though she was a black woman and I loved her and I adored her and I admired her and I saw things on her resume that I wanted to accomplish. And you know, I really did look up to her. I'm going to be honest. I looked up to her, but that racial loyalty, got me messed up fully and truly it really messed me up because I was blindly following a person I really had no business following I learned the hard way that she was doing one of the most nefarious possibly illegal allegedly I don't know Things that you could do at a nonprofit organization. Mind you, she's a black woman, black woman. The entire organization is black. It is a black led organization. And it wasn't like I saw it coming. It was completely out of the blue. Like the day before the situation went down, and she I was told what happened. It's really not my business to tell, even though I was traumatized by the situation. At the end of the day, I still feel like, you know, I don't have all the details, so I really can't say fully what happened. You know, and some of that is her story to tell. But I will say this. I was so disappointed in the way it happened. It made me call into question all the ways that she cultured me I allowed myself to be cultured by her right to have these very like white male centered values in the workplace to care so much about the written word 
to care so much about formalizing in emails, not really fully engulfing myself in relational work, even though I knew that was how you really built strong connections in the workplace. I just felt, um, I, I was like deeply disappointed and saddened, you know, and through that process, there were some legal things and I wasn't allowed to even reach out to my friend who was our partner. And that ruined our relationship. Now I can, but it, it's just been such a long time that I'm just like. Now, I will say in her defense, a few months later, she did reach out to me or it was actually a year later. She did send me a message on like this app that disappears where she apologized. She didn't admit to guilt or anything because, again, I don't actually fully know. And there's also legal ramifications. But like, I appreciated the apology. But when I tell y'all, I had a laser focus on who I allow to become mentors in my life, who I allow myself to idolize, who I allow myself to become, who I become proximate to, who I allow myself to connect with. What she did allegedly in that organization ruined my ability to even move forward because people connected me with her. And I had no idea what was going on, none. I, like, if somebody would have asked me independently, did you know this person was doing X, Y, Z? I would have said, absolutely not. This is a person of high moral character. Like, this is a person who, you know, it's hella black. They have events with black folks, you know, at their brownstone. You know, their partner works in, you know, around freedom work. Like, these are people that I looked up to. You know what I'm saying? I really saw value in them as a person. And it's not that I don't value them. And people should be allowed to make mistakes. But baby, when I tell you, when I dissected it, I had no business trotting around and behind. No. Mind you, I had a good black man mentor at my previous job that I left to come to that job to be with this other mentor. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Let's move on. I got to take a sip after that. Let me say this. I am not innocent as a manager, as a person who believed in girl bosshood. One of the biggest challenges I faced as a manager was terminating people and or letting people go and or perpetuating. Right. I started to catch it. But I, as I reflect, there were times where I, were, I was personally perpetuating the same trauma that I think was done to me. That's why I have a lot of grace for people in these situations. Because I would see somebody leaving and I would be like, where are you going? Hello, hello, poor behavior. Or I would say things like, oh, somebody's taking a seven day vacation. I'm like, oh, well, we need you to come back on this day. Hello, that's poor behavior. You don't know what type of rest they need. You don't know what type of work-life balance they need. I had a person that reported to me who taught me so much in his resignation. Honestly, the way he said, I need work-life balance and I cannot stay here and tolerate this kind of environment because I need more work-life balance. I respected the decision that he made. I was sad in that moment. I thought he was shooting himself in the foot. You know, he's so young. He can really go places. I'm going to be honest with you. I always took what he said and I remembered it. Because ultimately, that's, the, that's what I decided for myself. There was no job that was worth that level of stress. And I respected him in that moment. I respected him deeply in that moment. Honestly and truly. I will say this. Working in nonprofit has been some of the most taxing and toxic work I have ever experienced in my life. There are so many people with savior complexes from the donors to the executive directors, even at times organizers. The amount of times we are like dissecting isms, classism, racism, sexism, all these isms, you know, homophobia, transphobia, all these isms we are we are actively fighting to dissect. We are perpetuating in our organizations. 
Absolutely. Last story, but it's the juiciest, which is that same organization that was very toxic at times to me. I also had some really great experiences, but it was to it was toxic in some ways. Um, I had a colleague. First of all, I came to this organization as a fan. You know, I was in a leadership role at this organization. And there was an, another woman. Mind you, all these people I'm talking about are black. So there's no racial dynamic other person is black a woman when I tell you we could not be more opposite and I'm not trying to be shady but cosmetically we were completely opposite right like she we were both grown I think we're probably like two or three years apart she's like two or three years older than me you know she went to a great you know school she grew up in a middle class home she worked on the Obama administration she had a law degree she had all the credentials but she lacked generosity. She lacked relational work. She had jealousy tendencies, all these things. So here I was coming to the workplace with my sheath dresses on, my makeup, you know, very fun, extroverted. I'm in there to make relationships, build relationships, do my work, move up in the organization, do whatever I can. I was a director of organizing or executive director of organizing or senior director of organizing, vice president of organizing. I've had many of those roles. And so I was coming into this role, not in that capacity, but as the chief of staff. And she was already running the organizing entity of this organization. So I could see how she maybe felt threatened. I could see that. But I've worked with women all the time who, at first glance, they don't like me. But I'm like, boo. We're going to be girlfriends. Like, are you kidding? I know how to be girlfriends. And so that was my goal. When I tell you, I was like, I can easily win her over. I can be friends with anybody. I like what? We can be girlfriends. Honey, she was not having it. When I tell y'all. At first, I was in denial about the situation. I didn't understand the microaggressions. I didn't fully, I understood the power dynamic that she managed over 75% of the organization. She was there long, like she was one of the longest serving employees. Like she worked with my boss directly. She had a personal relationship. Like, so they knew each other. I didn't fully understand that until the rubber met the road. Honey, when I tell you, the like it was me and another colleague she was when I tell you and we were all on the senior leadership team executive senior leadership team when I tell you she was so horrible and nasty to me the way she talked to me the way she was disrespectful to me that I felt like I could deal with no that wasn't enough for her she decided to start rumors like are we in high school that I'm like doing things with her staff allegedly that I like the reason why her male staff are talking to me is because I'm up to no good. I'm doing things to them. We are proximate to each other. Like, girl, first of all, I am married. Second of all, it it doesn't give that. You know what I'm saying? Um, but it was the quintessential, typical, like, make the black woman who dresses up, does all the things, does the most, make her the Jezebel in the organization. And that was just like so far from my character. Like I've had the same boyfriend who is now my husband over half my life. But that was like, that was a good narrative to start. And like, I would talk to my boss about this. I would talk to HR about this. And I'm not even kidding. They would gaslight me. Like, it wasn't happening. Like, oh, well, you know, that's how she is. She has a drinking problem, allegedly. You know, like, all these things. And I'm like, okay. So, I'm supposed to dim myself, not come up with any ideas, face a ton of microaggressions, basically act like I'm an assistant. And I have more experience than she do at her own job. And I can speak to the public. I can be public facing all, and act like I'm not a fan of this organization when I truly am. Just so she can come to meetings with Timberland boots on and smelling like marijuana. And start rumors about me and allegedly be drunk and all, like, girl, what? Excuse me? Huh? It was too much for me. 
I think when I said to my boss, mind you, this organization, I probably would have, I probably would have said that to the end of time because that's how much I believed in the mission of the organization. When I said to my boss, basically, it's either her or me because we were put in remediation and we were put in like, you know, we had to basically sit face to face and do all these things, even though on a retreat with her staff, she basically had an entire outburst. She's crying to the HR person about me. Why am I here? My mere presence, she was triggered. Why is she here? Did you tell her that I said those things about her? Yeah, she did. The HR person told me. Yeah, that's who spilled your tea, Miss Thing. But, like, it was so messy and so unprofessional and so taxing. I was like, yeah, I need to go. My husband could not understand why I was crying to the point that I w wanted to throw up when I was leaving the organization. The organization I went to, the amount of respect, admiration, love, value that I had, the way they treated me, the way they poached me and the money they gave me, the, the, the bonus, I could not even understand why I said at the organization. But I know why, because I was so deeply committed to the mission. And this is how nonprofit organizations get you. I was so committed to the mission of that organization. I would have crossed every boundary that I had for my life. That organization was a microcosm of the challenges I faced with my family. We were working directly on racial justice issues, education issues, um, you know, youth incarceration, mass incarceration. These are all issues that I felt like were the reasons for systemic poverty that I had in my own life and that was causing the wedge between me and my family. My therapist was like, this is a manifestation of the trauma that you have and that you have not healed in your life whoa <laughs> and i was letting this woman literally abuse me in the workplace yes i was so i got up and left because i still believed in the mission of the organization i believe that the organization should exist right and that's how they get you to stay silent but i got up and got out of there there was no way when i was crying to my boss Tears running down my eyes to the point of throwing up, baby. And he gave very much, I was like, her or me, pretty much. And he was like, what? Her. <laughs> she was the cause of, I would say, 90% of the toxicity in the, in the organization. And in vindication news, less than two years later, they lost one of the largest parts of the organization, the leadership team of that uh, entity of the organization and almost the entire team due to some issues with her and her whole um, team then for the kicker. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. I don't know if this is completely true, but this is what I saw in the news. <laughs> is that she has lost... Uh, she was literally let go from the organization because of the same issues I had with her that she was perpetuated and doing to her own staff covering up mass egregious issues within the organization for years threatening staff committing violations like all kinds of stuff and they finally let her go yeah yeah even though when i said something about her doing it to me and her doing it to other people on like the development team and all these other teams oh see now i, I was the bad guy but here's the thing I have to be honest with you. I still have so much love for the organization. I still want the organization to succeed. I still believe in the beauty and the mission of the organization. And even though I had, I did not have the best experience, even though I tried to work through that experience, even though that experience was something that I thought was like, you know what? These are things that I could get over. Ultimately, no. You have to do what's best for you. And so I will conclude by saying this, when it comes to workplace challenges, when it comes to workplace trauma, you know, you have to figure out what's good for you. It's you cannot always think about, well, if I leave, I'm going to burden my my colleagues. If I don't tolerate this poor behavior, these things are going to happen to me. These things are going to happen to me. You have to ultimately do what works for you. And let me so we're coming to the end, honey. Oh, MG, I'm traumatized.
just talking about it and thinking through the workplace trauma. OMG. Like, if you have stories, I would love to hear some of these stories. I would love for you to share. I would love to talk about it. Because there are also young women, young men, young people who are trying to figure out how to navigate these situations. And in their minds, they think that they're over-exaggerating. They think it's not happening. It's happening. If you think it's happening, it's happening. Okay? And so I would love to hear some of your stories in the comments below. If you like this kind of content, please comment. Please subscribe. And also hit the bell notification so that you never miss an upload from me. And I will see you in the next video. Bye!